So this is a, this is a, a history and chiptune primer, if you will. Um, uh, I, I, how many people in here already know what a chiptune is? Okay, pretty awesome, right? Uh, so, so, so people that don't know what a chiptune is will benefit from the beginning of this presentation. And uh, you know, uh, people that already know what a chiptune is, I, I promise we'll get to more interesting stuff later. Uh, I've kind of tried to go from a zero to hero in this presentation so that you know, if you don't know something, we can fill in the gaps and then later on we'll start packing in more information, some tidbits that you don't know and that sort of a thing. So uh, I'm sorry if the beginning is not terribly interested or interesting to, to some of you, but I, I figured we'd start with an explanation of sound waves, uh, which is very simple. The, the, the power going out to your speakers is AC, not like AC 110 high amperage that you're going to zap yourself on. Uh, but the idea is, is that all we're doing is pushing out a, sound, a, a sine wave to a speaker that is AC that's basically causing the speaker to go in and out. And that's it. That's, that's all sound and speakers are. And if you look at you know, an oscilloscope or a visual representation of a sound wave, literally all the speaker is doing is following that sound wave uh, using you know, the x-axis as a function of time or whatever. So. Um, so let's, let's give you a sip, simple rundown. Uh, usually I go and I ask people, well, what is a chiptune? Everyone already kind of knows what a chiptune is. Um, but to give you some sound examples here, uh, here's something uh, to give you an idea, kind of set the stage for what you're going to be listening to a lot of, some Game Boy music. Very nostalgic to some people, especially me. Um, and we can skip ahead a little bit so that you can, uh, you know. And so, um, but, but chiptunes can sound a little bit different, uh, although you'll hear a lot of kind of same sounding or same soundy things, but just to, by contrast, here's some Commodore 64 music. Much more dense, much more full. Uh, you have different sound wave choices on the Commodore 64 that kind of lead to a different sound. You have filters, um, you know, all sorts of cool stuff on the Commodore. Um, really a meaty sound can come out of this thing. Did you want to ask your question? Um, are you in Unity to Linux? Yes, I run only Linux. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, um, so now that we've kind of explained what a chiptune is, not that half the room didn't already know, um, but there, there are definitely some things that you run into. Um, for example, there's a, uh, it, you know, so a lot of chiptune musicians are what I would maybe call second generation chiptune musicians. Uh, uh, at the end of the presentation, I'm, I'm going to just skip ahead, so to speak. Um, I mentioned that uh, in 99-2000, a package called LSDJ, Little Sound DJ, came out for the Game Boy, and so suddenly anyone with a Game Boy or anyone with $10 and garage sales near them could, could you know, grab a flash cart, throw it in their Game Boy, and make chiptunes on the go. Um, and it's just, it's a tracker for your Game Boy. And so, um, for, for some chiptuners anyway, me personally, I'm honored by this when people do it, but, uh, you know, if you, if you spent, you know, hours and hours writing a song on your Game Boy, right, and you jump up on stage at an open mic at a bar, or you know, maybe somewhere where people like kind of get what you're doing, but not really. Um, and you get off the stage, and this guy comes up, and he's like, "Man, I really liked your set. Uh, I really, it, you know, that Zelda song you played was amazing." <laughs> and you kind of sit there, and you're like, "Well, I, I wrote that from scratch. It's not a Zelda song." Now, me personally, I would be honored that someone would be like, "Oh man, that that sounds like the music of my childhood. That sounds like Zelda. I really enjoyed that." Is is what the person's trying to say, but they may not have recognized that you know, like it's an original composition. So, um, there, there, um, there are some people that don't like chip tunes being recognized as game music, but they kind of forget they're holding a Game Boy uh, in the process because the Game Boy was their musical instrument, not a like a game system of their childhood or whatever. Uh, but there are several things that a chip tune is not. Jumping back to the present. Um, and one of them is, you know, it's not just simple tones, um, and it's also not MIDI. Um, chiptunes don't speak, uh, or MIDI doesn't speak chiptune or whatever. These are chips with like registers and pins, and all you do is, you know, like send information to these chips as if they're memory. 
and those chips have engineering inside of them. They're, you know, they're not CPUs. They're like things that all they do is accept maybe 20 bytes worth of data and figure out how to synthesize a sound wave. And they're already engineered to, to synthesize that sound wave, so they're very limited in that regard. And they're taking this data and they're like, okay, he sent 64 to this register, so that must be a note value, you know, uh, because he sent it to the note value register. And you don't say, I want 440 hertz, which is like your natural A. They, they say, you know, say you ask for tone number 67. Uh, you've got a crystal. Usually if it's a game system, it'll be like an NTSC burst crystal, 3.58 megahertz. It divides that by, say, 64 or something to get it down to a reasonable place. And then it takes that number that it ends up at and divides by whatever frequency you asked for. So divide again by 67. And whatever frequency that is, it poops it out. Uh, you know, so so that's that's kind of how these sound chips work. Um, so obviously, this uh, you know is not uh, you're not listening to a chip tune here. Here's something uh, that is a common misconception with the MIDI thing, right? So MIDI is a protocol. MIDI doesn't have a sound, but some people are like, I really like that MIDI sound. And usually, what they're talking about is something like this which eventually it will come out. Uh, the first music that we listened to on our PCs was coming out of probably an AdLib or a Sound Blaster card. And on that AdLib or Sound Blaster card is a chip labeled YM3812, or the OPL2 chip, and that is FM. Um, and FM is a chiptune technology. I mean, so the theory behind FM is not chiptune at all. It's just a bunch of math. Um, but, uh, but FM became implemented on so many things, and the FM chip itself is engineered the same way. It's not a CPU, it's not, you know, there's, there's no arithmetic logic unit that's like calculating things and figuring out what to send out. You're, you're literally just sending it values, and it's saying, okay, well, the values are set to this, the sound wave sounds like this. Um, so it is not any of these things. Uh, usually samples lasting several seconds, although there are exceptions to this. Uh, most chip tunes that you listen to aren't, aren't going to have more than maybe one voice sample or, you know, uh, drum samples that are extremely short so that they can fit in the memory space that is allotted to you for the chip tunes. Um, 80s music is a great one. Um, although some 80s music that you might listen to, uh, who, who listens to Aha or Take On Me? Uh, at least a reasonable number of people have heard that song. The bass in that song uh, is, I believe, a DX7 or something that you can reproduce using a DX7. Um, and uh, if you ever hear sounds like that, or if you listen to, you know, like old car songs, or you'll hear like square wave tones and that sort of a thing, because a lot of the sound generators came out at the same time that these sound chips were coming out. And they were like, oh, how do we make electronic music with this thing? And so, um, but but usually 80s music is not specifically considered you know, uh, or synthesizer wanker or whatever, you, you know, things that sound retro. Okay, so um, I explained a little bit about this, but um, some people will say chiptunes aren't video game music, and some people take that a step further. And actually, I don't disagree with the chiptunes and video game music thing. I think that the first video game composers are also the first chiptune composers, really, if you think about it. Um, you know, they, they, they were just musicians that wanted to be recognized as musicians, and that's that's kind of the problem that, you know, like Joe that wrote something on his Game Boy and accidentally got called the Zelda song, uh, you know, like he's running into that. But uh, there is definitely a difference in genre, so to speak. You can write classical sounding chiptunes, you can write rock sounding chiptunes, you can write hip hop, you know, whatever. Um, so, so some people say chiptune isn't really a genre, although it seems like people that like chiptunes are willing to listen to all of those things coming out of sound chip, probably because they're fascinated by the technology or that sort of a thing. Um, so, you know, but most of us just, you know, like want to be recognized as musicians. Here's my holding a Game Boy dig that I did earlier. But usually what I do is click through all of these slides and say, people should shut up and write music. Uh, don't get serious. So um, anyway, let's, uh, let's move forward. Where did chiptunes come from? How is Babby formed? Um, old games are dissonant and crappy sounding. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, let's, let's start even earlier than the Atari. We start with like Pongs or, you know, a Fairchild or whatever. These, these chips 
or the sound hardware in these systems usually knows how to make a low tone, a high tone, and maybe fuzz, or something like that. Um, and so, you know, people wanted jingles and games. They wanted, and the ante got kind of up to full-on intro songs. So jingles and games, you could think of like, you know, E.T. starts with the, you know, a couple bars of the E.T. sounding really pretty awful, but um, that, we'll, we'll talk about why that is later. Uh, the ante on jingles goes up to full-on intro songs, you know, like California games, even for the Atari 2600, has a pretty decent, solid, long rendition of Louie Louie, and it sounds pretty good. Uh, you know, that becomes entire soundtracks to games, kind of starting with the NES and the Commodore 64. Uh, old school hardware geeks wanted neat sounds from chips. It's, it's really, you know, how do I make music with this little IC that I've got? So why do that now? Well, maybe you have an odd penchant for obscure hardware. Maybe you're at VCF. Um, maybe you want nostalgic gaming music. Maybe you enjoy working under potentially strange limitations. Another way to say this is maybe you're a little bit masochistic. Uh, maybe you like the pure or simple sound. Like, I mean, the square wave is definitely a complex sound, but the look of the wave itself is very, you know, like simple and pure and produced by DC and whatever. So representing it by a sine wave, you have to go into overtones and that sort of thing. But even still, you know, like you've got these simple shapes for waves. You can't really change them that much. Maybe you, maybe you enjoy that. Maybe you like it. Maybe it's pleasing to your ear. Maybe you're a huge nerd. Yeah. Um, maybe you need to produce really small files with tons of music in them. Uh, a good example of this would be uh, old crack tros, like for the Commodore 64, when you put in a pirated game and you get like a Starfield, a logo, and hey, my name is Joe, I'm a better cracker than you, and obviously you should call my BBS, um, you know, that sort of a thing. But those, you know, like you, you crack a game, right, and you've only got 4K left on the disc, what do you do with that 4K? Well. A chip tune doesn't take up that much room, so I guess we could play some cool music while we're talking about you know how awesome we are and that sort of thing. Um, kind of the gangster rap scene of computers, you know. Uh, but uh, but anyway, I'm I'm sure Jim hiding in the back wouldn't know anything about crack tros or the demo scene. Uh, no comment. No comment. Um, so uh, so we have some types of chip tunes or chip tuners or whatever, and this kind of ties into the the question about the the tracker and uh, that sort of a thing. So we've got the extreme purists that really just want the real deal, and only the real deal it had to be written on the hardware, it has to play on the hardware, that sort of a thing. We have, like, uh, we have a category that sometimes is, inst instead of called 8-bit, it's called fake bit, uh, you know, ha ha. Uh, but, but there's like kind of two categories of this. There's the people that like, uh, want, the, want the aesthetic and follow the rules, but don't necessarily use the right software either emulation or even like Nintendo samples, but using them the right way, um, that sort of a thing. Um, and then there's the naughty fake bidders. Uh, I usually, instead of rip, uh, chip tunes, I call these rip tunes. You're supposed to laugh. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, no, uh, it, it, people that don't really care, uh, there are good, a lot of good examples. If you go out onto YouTube and you're like, you know, my favorite song, 8-Bit Remix, uh, you'll come up with a lot of like things that, you know, like, oh, it says 8-bit, it must be 8-bit. Well, not really. Um, they use some program that just makes every instrument a square wave or fuzz and, you know, poops it out of the speakers or whatever. But those are usually, no, no, none of these old sound chips really do like, you know, 30 or 40 sound waves at a time, which often MIDI files are allowed to do. Uh, you know, most of the common chips that you're listening to, like, NES, Sega Master System, Atari, whatever, will give you, you know, like three tones and one white noise or a combination of that that usually ends in like four or five channels. That's all you've got. Uh, so, you know, on some of these chips, you play a chord, C, E, G, you're dead. That's it. There's no more. You can play that chord or you can play, you know, a single note of bass, a single note of melody, a single note of harmony, that sort of a thing. Come in, sit down. Um, and so then you have chiptune bands. Uh, these are, this is also something I like to refer to as chiptune plus. Uh, these are the people that like chiptune is a part of what they do, but then they want to add to it. Uh, if you've ever listened to like Anna Managuchi, uh, they're, you know, like an NES is a part of their band, but then they have a drummer and a guitarist and that sort of thing. So uh, earlier I mentioned some limitations, and I did mention already, you know, sound chips are hardware, they're not software, they're not CPUs running software. So you give the chip notes and parameters, you might be limited in frequencies. Um, these, these chips are in 8-bit computers, 
um, but they're not 8-bit sound. Most of them are putting out 4-bit sound on each channel. So you have six, uh, again, we're going back to the positions of the speaker, right? So four bits, how many, uh, who, who, want, who does binary? Who knows how many values are in, in four bits? 16, so that's how many positions we can put the speaker in on these old sound chips if we're playing one channel stuff. So, uh, you know, like there's another bit value that you send for the frequency and, uh, you know, again, this depends on a lot of things like how your registers are laid out on the chip or whatever, but you could, uh, on the Atari 2600, which sounds like garbage, uh, you have five bits of frequency resolution, which means you get 32 notes. They're not really chromatically spaced or anything, so, you know, it's like, and it's like way up. Uh, so less bit depth in frequencies means more space between your frequencies. You may not have special effects. The chip may not know how to do envelopes. It may not be able to pitch bend on its own, like the NES has something called sweep, where you can just tell it to pitch bend and it won't stop until you tell it to stop. You may not have volume control. On the NES, your triangle wave is full blast or not at all. Um, you know, less bit depth in your volume control means less volume choices. Um, some of the volume changes are logarithmic instead of linear. That could screw you up if you're trying to like fade something in or out. No volume control at all, like the PC speaker or the ZX Spectrum or the Apple. Um, you know, then, then you're writing what's called beeper music, which is one bit music. It might not necessarily be considered chip tune because nothing's really synthesizing it. You're writing software again, uh, but it, it, this is a thing that you get no volume control. So people would try to imitate a volume fade out by slowly thinning out the square wave until it's nothing. And that would kind of, you know, yeah, we have some examples. Fine grain tempo control is not practical. So what's the uh, frequency of the power that comes out of your wall here? All right. so. What's the refresh of your television screen or whatever? So, when you're drawing images on that TV, usually your CPU is busy. So the time to update your sound chip, the time to figure out if player one died, the time to figure out where the enemies moved to, the time to figure out if those bullets are going in that direction or this direction, the time to read the input is usually only when, in a CRT, the gun is returning to the top of the screen. Or in an LCD, it's just called the vertical blanking interrupt. I mean, it is always, but uh, you know, it, in that sh very short period when you're not drawing graphics on the screen is when you can update everything. So if you can only update the chip 60 times a second, then there's you know a limited amount of math and beats per minute and that sort of thing that you can do. And what a lot of people found out is that the magic beats per minute uh, to, to use is 150. Does anyone know why that is? Is there any other place in the world that doesn't have 60 hertz power? What do you think their TV scans at? There you go. So if you do all of the funky math that you need to do, uh, you find out that if you have 50 hertz or 60 hertz, uh, you can do 150 beats per minute or some of the same tempos. As long as you keep it at the same tempo, you can play it on either PAL or NTSC with very minimal changes. Um, but if you don't make those changes, then you, you take your game to Europe and it just runs slower. Um, so uh, yeah, and that's what I just explained. So type, types of sound chips. Um, promise this isn't too boring. Is everyone okay so far? Are you with me? Did I lose anyone? It's okay if I did. Okay, good. Um, so PSGs. Um, so um, chip tunes usually refers to the beepy boopy stuff, although we did shout out FM earlier, right? But, um, but most of the time, FM kind of gets left out of the picture. People are trying to make music with Game Boys. Um, that is a sad truth. Uh, <laughs> I, I really enjoy more than just Game Boy music, so I try to kind of push those other systems to the forefront whenever I play a show. Um, but uh, so you're really, you're, these are program, uh, the, the term programmable sound generator was first coined uh, by S uh, Steve Burstein, the guy that uh, engineered the AY38910 which is the sound chip in the Intellivision, and then like a billion other things after that. Uh, but originally kind of designed, well, originally designed because General Instrument designed the chip and they were working on Pongs and a bunch of other like entertainment stuff. And then they were like, oh, well, we've got this neat Intellivision project. Maybe we should do something with that. Um, and so the AY kind of first appeared in the Intellivision 
and then slowly, you know, uh, got bug fixed and, you know, ended up in everything else like Vectrex, MSX, uh, a, a, as a, a Yamaha clone as the YM2149 uh, in the Atari ST, in a pile of arcade machines, in the ZX Spectrum, in the Amstrad CPC. Um, but this use, it generates sound using DC current. This is the one that everyone calls as 8-bit. Very renowned for its square waves. Some chips can make different sounds, but all of them can do square waves or fuzz or that sort of a thing. We talked about the tones and everything. That was the rest of that slide. So um, some examples, just to recap the other stuff that I didn't say. Uh, sound generation is built into the Nintendo CPUs. So some people are like, I like that 2A03 sound, and that is a correct statement, but the 2A03 is a 6502 with sound generation kind of crammed up its butt. So um, it's, it is a, a sound, and it, you know, the, the reason is, is, you know, think to the 70s or 80s, how much does it cost to build a chip? So they're saving like five or 10 bucks in their production process by just building things into other things. Uh, so sound in the CPU, um, Nintendo designed it. Actually, uh, Hirokazu Tanaka, or Hip Tanaka, the guy that wrote the music for like Kid Icarus um, or Metroid is probably a little bit more no uh, known or whatever. Uh, this guy was like an engineer uh, and musician that ended up doing all of the like early jingles for all of the Nintendo games that you pop in and they play like 10 second ditties. Um, that guy did all of those and kind of pioneered moving the sound into the chip and they shoinked pretty much the same thing that they shoinked into the Nintendo into the Game Boy with some, some changes, and we can talk about those later. Um, here's the AY38910 and a pile of systems. There's another chip that was, you know, meanwhile in Texas, um, you had the SN76489, there's also the SN76496, the SN94624, the TMS9919. They're all the same thing, actually. They're all this chip from TI, which is kind of a clone of the AY, um, three square waves and white noise. Um, and that was ColecoVision, Master System, PC clones that had three voice sound, like the, uh, the Tandy and the PC Junior. Um, and then here's one of my favorites, the SID, which with two revisions, so you got two different numbers there. Uh, only in the 64, the 128, and before someone shouts out, also in the Max. Um, <laughs> but not in the VIC-20, which was the VIC-1, or the plus four that has a TED. Um, so, so just to give you an idea, I, for, for anyone that hasn't really looked at a sound wave, yes, a square wave really looks like a square, and yes, a triangle wave really looks like a triangle and that sort of a thing, or uh, here's a sawtooth wave. Notice the sawtooth is different from the triangle. They, they also sound pretty different. Um, only wave channels or FM does sine waves. Also, here's what fuzz fuzz, fuzzy McFuzzerton, whatever, looks like, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you like that. Um, so, so not so tonal waves, you know, there's your fuzz. It's just, uh, I, I've realized that although, al although almost everyone in this room knows what TV fuzz sounds like, like I've given this presentation to a few like anime conventions and that sort of a thing, and I was like, who knows fuzz on their TV? And like half of the hands don't go up because they grew up with TVs that have sound muting when there's no picture or no, you know, a channel or whatever. Um, so let's, let's talk about FM a little bit. Everyone cool on PSG so far? All right. Um, so FM generates sound using TMATH. Um, if you ever uh, messed around on a graphing calculator or you know, you're in algebra or whatever uh, and you're like just typing in equations, you're like, whoa, that wave does that and that wave does this and whatever. Um, that's kind of one of the bases, bases whatever, behind uh, FM. Um, really, the way the, the inventor of FM, uh, Dr. John Chowning, explains it is he was explaining uh, that he was experimenting with really fast vibrato. And he realized that if he, you know, he was like, well, you know, vibrato is just when you're going woo, 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 you know, uh, and trying to vary the frequency just a little bit, you know, or when you're playing a violin and you, you're playing it with feeling or, you know, whatever. But, um, but since he had a computer, you know, computers are fast and stuff, we could make it faster, right? But what if we made it too fast? Um, then suddenly your sound wave starts kind of, I, I, I don't want to say colliding with itself, but you're sampling a wave and it's different frequencies at different times, so you're actually ending up with a different sound wave because of the, of the waveform collision and the way the wave is being modulated. Um, so he discovered this technique in the 60s. They applied for a patent in the 70s. Uh, the only 
company that they, they approached like, I don't know, a hundred keyboard companies and like music companies and instrument companies. And the only guys that really wanted to jump on board were Yamaha. Um, and so if you ever mess with like an old Yamaha keyboard, they all have that kind of, you know, like farty bass sound or whatever, you know, like, and that they all sound the same because they're all, well, almost all, you know, are based on FM and that sort of a thing. So you started to hear this and then in 19, like the late 70s, uh, they were finally awarded the patent. The sole licensee was, you know, uh, Yamaha and Stanford actually owned the patent, Stanford University where John Chowning worked. Uh, because they had a cool, we'll manage your patent and your lawsuits and whatever, and you get some of the royalties off of it, but they just handle it. So he handed it off to them, and it was actually, I think, to date or to almost recent date, their, their most uh, money-making patent that they ever had, uh, which is fascinating. F it basically funded the entire uh, computer music department at Stanford, which is called Karma, C-C-R-M-A. Um, but uh, what they found out is uh, with, uh, with John and Yamaha, you know, bouncing ideas back and forth, they found out that they could imitate natural tones really well. Bells, pianos, trumpets, things that you're already kind of sending a sine wave into and it's being permuted by natural things. You can just do math and figure that out, right? So uh, why not do that? Um, so I've already explained a lot of this. and. Uh, we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time on it later maybe, um, but this uses operators and the way the Yamaha chips do is you have a carrier wave which is just, you know, I want to play C sharp or whatever, you know, that, that is your carrier tone and it's just a sine wave, you know, hoo, hoo, hoo. Um, and then you have a modulator or an overtone wave or that sort of a thing, uh, an extra operator that can affect that carrier tone in some way. Um, and depending on how many operators you have total, you have a carrier wave plus the extras. So a two operator has only one extra uh, modulating tone, or a four operator chip has one carrier wave and three ways to screw with it. Uh, you know, that sort of a thing. So you create a, sep a single instrument, and obviously, as you might be able to guess, uh, you can create a more complex instrument if you have more operators. Um, yes? Is this the basis of like Casio's and Orr's kind of innovation? Um, Mostly, so, so Casio uses a different technique that is similar to, but not the same as, but the, the Yamaha keyboards, which uh, people might argue sound kind of the same or whatever, is, it's, it's the same thing. Um, and uh, who in here listens to dubstep? Don't be afraid, I won't make fun of you. Um, so bass wobbles in dubstep are based on this technique. Um, so different FM chips offer a different number of operators. A lot of them have presets. If anyone remembers the really old Porta sound, which actually sort of has a, a meme of Casio keyboards where you have like harpsichord, e-piano, bass, trumpet, tuba, vibraphone. You know. um, so, you know, like on, on some of the Yamaha chips, uh, the YM2413, for example, those are just presets. And you can only have one user-defined instrument on that chip. Um, so, so you're stuck with like, you know, tuba, et cetera. Um, and when you push that button for instrument two, all it literally does is say channel one, instrument two to the chip. The chip already knows, you know, what instrument two sound like, it sounds like. So, um, so that contributes to a lot of similar sounds. Um, so, um, let's see, uh, oh yeah, and FM, actually this is kind of important in a way. Um, also, my laptop seems to be not excited with me. There we go. Um, I, I mentioned that the FM didn't have a whole lot of market penetration. And the reason that uh, I mentioned that is because FM in Japan, Yamaha being a Japanese company, they introduced it into a bunch of things in like the early 80s and mid 80s. But really, if you think about it, other than those Yamaha keyboards, what are the things that had FM in the US that we were introduced to? Sega Genesis, 1989. Sound Blaster and AdLib, like 87, 88, 89. So like late 80s is really where we started seeing FM, whereas in Japan, in 1985, there was a computer with FM. So, uh, so they had it a lot sooner. Um, and really, we would only see it maybe in some of the, uh, the, the like mid 80s, late 80s arcade machines that did not go beep boop, that is. Um, so uh, just in case, uh, you know, here are some systems that have a whole bunch of FM sound chips. Anyone notice anything in common? Yep, all the same company even. 
Um, so there's that. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip over that. Uh, but uh, so how, uh, now, now that you're uh, doing some chip tunes and whatever, uh, how, how do you make these beep boops actually sound good, right? Um, one, one good example, and unfortunately, really the only chip to do this well is the Commodore 64, um, but you have oh, my, uh, let's go back. Uh, you can bend the sound wave a little bit. So this is a square wave, which if you look over at A, you know, it looks like this, but they're going back and forth between A and C to kind of give you that sort of guitar wah-wah pedal sounding thing. Um, another cool trick is arps. I mentioned you play a chord and you're dead, right? Um, so how can you, how, how can man play chord uh, if, you, if you don't have enough channels and you want to continue to play other stuff? So here's someone building an arpeggio and the idea is think piano trill where you're only playing one note at a time and you're iterating over those notes. Uh, but do it fast, because computers are fast and stuff. Um, so an example of this is uh, here you'll see, uh, you know, the video guy build a bunch of sound waves here, uh, which I'm going to skip a little bit forward because, uh, oh, we're doing okay on time. Um, so uh, you see a bunch of sound waves built, and then you'll see uh, on the left side of the tracker, uh, uh, just a pile of notes laid down, uh, some variances in volume and that sort of thing, but then a command in the FX channel that says either 037 or 047, um, and, uh, and some variance in the sound wave that's chosen. And so, uh, who here has music training? Awesome. So, you know, C major chord, right? C, E, G. If you think about this with zero as your root note, the C, um, and you think in terms of semitones, 0, 4, 7 is four semitones up from your root note and seven semitones up from your root note. So if you issue that command in a tracker, it will iterate over those every vertical blanking period or every two vertical blanking periods to kind of give the impression of a chord. And so here you'll see everything get lit and laid down and whatever. I might be able to full screen this, but I'm don't want a chance that it could screw things up. Um, and then a bunch of zero commands laid in, and zero thirty-seven, and then what? Also changing the instrument value. I guess I could use a mouse cursor. The instrument value is being changed here, and then a pile of volume values are just about to be added, and then a tempo command at the end, and we'll listen to what this ARP sounds like. Um, and you might be surprised, you're thinking like this is one channel and there's only two notes in here, but we're using an ARP, right? So what is that going to sound like? How can we make interesting music with only one sound channel here? And the answer is... Not bad. And you've heard that in a billion games, I'm sure. But um, so that is, uh, well, you'll hear it in a billion games later, all right? Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure to influence you the right way. Um, so now, while well, my laptop thinks about loading the next uh, so So macros are an interesting way to define those. Uh, the, the, the 037 thing, you can implement into uh, certain playback routines, like a tracker is technically a playback routine, right? Um, but also in uh, you know very basic sound drivers and the like, you can you can like for example, uh, who here wrote music in BASIC? Anyone you use the play command? You know like play C three O five F four you know whatever you're inputting like very basic things. So technically, if you store that in a variable, um, that that sort of thing evolved later into something that people call music markup language MML. Um, and you can leave certain things out uh, and then prepend, you know, I would like my bass note to be C or prepend, I would like my octave to be five or prepend, you know, I would like my volume to be this. And then you would basically be able to do certain things but then affect it slightly. You could use it to change your music key without having to change your melody line. 
Uh, you could use it to change the volume of something faded in or out by you know, doing that sort of a thing. So you can define durations, envelopes, a set of frequencies, quick macros, longer macros. Uh, you, can, you can do that ARP thing, but do it with white noise. Create drums. Uh, like who here played Metal Gear or Ninja Turtles on the NES? So that snare drum in there is not actually a sample. It's a six or seven step white noise macro. Um, and it sounds really good because it's, it's iterating through those tones fast enough that you, know, like you don't hear you know, a variance in, in the white noise. You just hear what it's supposed to sound like. Uh, you don't want to remember frequencies, a snare. Yeah, I already, so uh, you can do echoes and plinks. Like you could say, hey, uh, I want one octave up from the bass note, but not define the bass note, right? And say, I want one octave up and then end at the bass note that I played. Um, and, uh, and set two volume values and then kind of hit a note and end up with sort of a plink sound, you know, that has like a high note at the very beginning, but only for a split second and then ends, you know, imitates like kind of hitting, hitting a piano key and letting off really fast and that sort of thing. So to implement this, you obviously, obviously you're going to need code that supports your macros. Write it and pray. Uh, so how do people do this? Uh, old style. Um, well, there, this, this joke is now very old, but uh, if you've ever watched that Ventrilo harassment video. Um, but, uh, but old style is, you know, like I, I explained a little bit of this, you know, uh, people didn't really know music. They knew engineering and whatever. So we had engineers writing, you know, music on sound chips and whatever, and maybe they weren't that great at music, but they were good at engineering, and so, you know, they wanted to make things happen. And so uh, eventually they started giving programmers with music experience you know, access to the hardware and got slightly better results. And soon the programmers were like, okay, we're just going to hand this off to musicians. And so the programmers would write a piece of software that would expose all of the, you know, capabilities of a chip or whatever and just hand it off to a musician and say, go nuts. And so the musician would go nuts and it would sound good. Um, and people began to fantasize. So um, new style, trackers. Trackers, trackers, trackers. Trackers, this bullet point says trackers, that bullet point says trackers. No, they don't. But um, there, there are a lot of cool new things that people are doing with you know, chiptune stuff. Uh, MML, I mentioned, has evolved into a very complicated markup language. You can write very short songs in uh, a very even smaller amount of space than you know, like tracker, tracker data can be stored in. Um, circuit bending isn't really a chiptune thing, but a lot of people will circuit bend chiptune instruments or chiptune based uh, instruments and that sort of thing. I feel like it kind of goes in here because we're all like trying to hack hardware to do stuff it shouldn't. Um, imitation, you know, you can synchronize a bunch of computers. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm building a synthesizer that will have a whole bunch of chips. So, you know, I mean like I'm, that, that's kind of an example. Uh, the original flare, I mentioned chiptune plus, if you want to call it that earlier or whatever. You know, people rapping on chiptunes. Chiptune is an element of other music, like the bands. I don't know why this says derp. Um, so revolution number one. We mentioned crack trows, right? Who here has not seen a crack trow? Great. So here's what a crack trow looks like. So picture you just you just pirated a game from a friend, and you put the uh, the floppy in the drive. If you've ever seen a floppy disk, and uh, this this is what happens. And you're like, what? That's not the Pac-Man game that I just pirated. No, it's the, it's the the cracker of the game leaving his or her mark. You know, um, it's a uh, you know, and you've got this fancy logo, and behold, the Starfield I mentioned earlier, pre presenting Ice Temple at the bottom. He's probably talking about, you know, how cool he is. Um, you know, sometimes people would also leave their mark by changing the credits of the game. So you know, instead of Pac-Man by you know. Uh, by Namco or whatever it be, Pac-Man by Jimmy or Roger, or whoever uh, you know. So those were one one way to do it. Um, and so eventually, uh, you know, and these had to be small to fit on a disc. So it'd just be kind of a cool thing. Um, so uh, very shortly after, uh, some of that scene kind of got sick of breaking games and just realized, hey. Um, what if we had the entire floppy disk to do the same thing and no game to crack, and we just wanted to show, out, show off how awesome our code and our art and our music is? And so, you know, just as an example, I'm going to try and full screen this, even if it breaks something. Um, 
we, we got full screen, full length. You know, and this is, this fits on a floppy disk and is six minutes long. And I believe this is slightly cheating. I think this is too sick. But this is something you can get on, you know, a Commodore 64. And aside from the SID, the, the dual SID, I don't think this machine is modified in any way. Nope. I apologize for my laptop in advance. This would normally be running at 60 hertz, but <laughs> they can't make computers that run at 60 hertz these days. <laughs> A year has passed since our latest release. Obviously, we're awesome. So now it's showtime. And uh, remember, it's not a uh, it's not a demo if there's not a spinning cube somewhere. Uh, I actually uh, at some some conventions and events I run a demo scene presentation called uh, my spinning my spinning cube is better than your spinning cube. Um, but uh, I have a feeling if I did that presentation here, uh, the last demo I would need to show would be something written by Jim on the spot and it would best them all. Um, so anyway, you know, obviously we're, we have to skip ahead, but that's, you know, a minute worth of, yep, okay, so that's what happens when I hit escape. Come on, laptop. Eventually it'll give up. Yeah, there we go. So no gamer disc on the demo, but that gives us an example of, I don't know why... Um, we're about to run out of time, but the presentation's almost about over. Um, if, uh, if you have any questions, I know the, uh, the, the auction uh, is right after me, so be sure to stay for the auction and give the show lots of money. Uh, but if you don't have any money to give the show, uh, for example me, um, then I will be in the other room showing off synthesizer stuff, and um, I can answer any questions that are burning in your mind or whatever, and I'll be DJing then. So, um, so introducing the tracker. Um, so, uh, started out kind of like a four-track recorder with some exceptions. You're controlling instruments instead of, you know, like long recordings that you recorded with a multi-track um, and that sort of thing. You have fine grain control over pitch, instrument effects, generally speaking, written by demo groups so that they can get musicians to write music for their demos and then shoink that file format directly into their demo. Um, and everyone latched onto this tracker look and made their own. Um, I, I wish I had a, you know, how many demos do you, th or how many trackers do you think exist in the world jar and a prize to give away, but, uh, you know, there, there have to be at this point over a thousand different tracker uh, applications. I used to say hundreds and I very quickly realized it's even more than that. Um, but really everyone latched onto this, you know, um, here you can see Mad Tracker and, uh, you know, an MSX tracker in the corner, Maximizer by Gwem for the uh, Atari ST. Uh, there's also Renoise and a bunch of modern trackers that, uh, even Modplug Tracker, which was originally, you know, designed as, you know, like a, a mod making machine or whatever, now supports like Visti instruments and plugins and all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, so here's what I referenced at the beginning. Uh, I don't know if anyone watches Co Conan O'Brien and gets this joke up top uh, where he, they go, in the year 2000! Um, but, you know, uh, this is really just me digging at all of the Game Boy music, uh, musicians on the scene. There's no real substance in this uh, slide except for LSDJ came out in 2000, and that thus began the second kind of chiptune revolution. Um, before, you know, we were all writing demo scene stuff and chiptunes and mods and stuff in Goat Tracker and whatever, and, you know, everyone was happy. And now, you know, if you hear a chiptune, like, you Google for chiptunes, like, half of the time or more, you'll end up at like someone's Game Boy track. And uh, to be fair, LSDJ is a pretty impressive piece of kit. Uh, you can, they have MIDI keyboards and a MIDI interface and like sync interfaces and like a PS2 keyboard interface for the Game Boy so that you can tap out chip tunes on a QWERTY keyboard. And uh, you, can, you can get a, a link, like a Game Boy link cable that you play head to head, head, -to -head Tetris with link two LSDJs together, get eight channel sound. Uh, you know, I mean, just like tons of crazy things. Uh, you know, so, so it's all downhill from there. You know, we've got, now we've got 
multiple sound chips and different machines and that sort of a thing. Uh, you know, there's, there's Pokey and Gumby if you want, you know, like to do an Atari 8-bit modification, uh, get eight channels out of your Atari. There's 2-SID and 3-SID on the Commodore 64. There's my synthesizer thing, which is completely insane because I want to be able to control as many sound chips as I can using only USB, and I've got a 13-port USB hub, so how many sound chips can I control? Um, might be even more than 13 if I can fit them all on. Um, but uh, that is the end of this presentation. Are there any super burning questions that I can answer uh, before we take off? What's your favorite tracker? Whew. Um, oh, <laughs> so so, so my, my, my original true love is Fast Tracker. Um, I, did, I did have a very brief affair with Scream Tracker and Impulse Tracker, but in the end, I ended up back at Fast Tracker too. Um, and then the, the tracker that I chose to kind of shoink all of the, uh, all of the chip emulation backends and whatever into was Sound Tracker for Linux, which is a Fast Tracker 2 clone that uses Open Cubic Player as the, the back end. Um, so I was able to do that sort of you know, back end hacking or whatever with that. And then didn't have to recycle much code for OpenCP, uh, which was kind of an added bonus, I suppose. Um, so, so those are my original loves. Um, if I want to do authentic work um, and not a, a broken, you know, like hacked together piece of whatever, um, I will often use Defil Mask that I showed just a little bit earlier. And you can you can take a quick look at that, you know, like. It looks just like every other tracker. Every tracker looks like every other tracker. Um, I did some Sega Genesis stuff in here. Um, and uh, just to give you an example of like, uh, you know. Uh, so it, it runs just like a tracker. Um, one, one interesting thing about this and Famitracker, which is another one that I use to write NES music, is that instead of patterns, you have your patterns broken out into the individual channels which sometimes makes doing, you know, like a melody part easy because you're going to repeat the drums over and over again and, you know, maybe do a fill every once in a while, but other than that, they're the same. Um, but uh, this gives you an idea of what it's like to write, you know, Sega Genesis music in a tracker. Um, I, I get my meme sounds in here. The Genesis can do PCM. So right about now, uh, you're hearing the Jeopardy theme, which I'm sure the uh, people running the auction would be playing for me uh, if they could. And uh, that means I should probably, or, uh, yeah, it's 53 after. The auction starts in seven minutes. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I'm going to shout it out here. Um, I'll be DJing in the other room starting at maybe around six or something like that. Um, just kind of playing music for the rest of the night. Uh, you can come and ask me about chip tunes wherever I end up in the room. Just follow the beeps, um, and uh, you know I'd, I'd love to answer more questions for you. Uh, bless you. I I, uh, I also brought down. Uh, I flew here from Baltimore, uh, so I have a whole pile of CDs that might make my luggage weigh a lot. I would love to replace those CDs with money, uh, so that one I can. Uh, <laughs> I, I would love to replace those CDs with money because one, they don't weigh a lot. I have computer gear that I've been taking from the free pile that needs to go home. Two, uh, I also have not purchased my plane ticket home yet, so I would love to be able to do that. Um, and, uh, and if you're not into you know, CDs, I understand that not everyone has a thing that plays those these days. Uh, it's a little bit old school. Uh, I also have shirts that you can wear because everyone needs clothes. Uh, so uh, thanks very much for coming. Uh, And uh, stay tuned for the auction.